Okay, good morning, everyone. A very nice good morning on Monday. Uh, it's uh, in the continuation of the lecture series of uh, IAPC Academy and uh, Academy of Palliative Medicine. Uh, this is again a very important topic and rarely discussed. What uh, <clears throat> is what is the area which we have to definitely know? We should be knowing in area of palliative dermatology. So um, um, because these classes are for uh, students, D MD and DNBs, so we are trying to go into the more depth of palliative medicine. And today the topic is palliative dermatology. What are the areas which need to be explored? For the speaker, uh, Dr. Rabia Rajak. Rab Rabia is our senior resident. She did Vihar MD. And uh, she's now doing senior residency um, uh, at uh, Ames. Uh, she is uh, basically, uh, she, she, she always takes fantastic lectures. And she must have taken one or two before lectures. And I think bone pain definitely she must have taken. And today this uh, tough topic we have given to Rabia. So that let's see that what she speaks. And recently, besides there are a lot of... Uh, posters and papers awards recently she has got there was a big uh, uh, oncology conference in delhi and uh, she got the first uh, oral uh, pr first prize in oral presentation and also the uh, her poster got the best prize so this is the way uh, this is what rabia is and for to moderate rabia the, uh, uh, another brilliant faculty of our department dr sorobe um, he is assistant professor and whatever Saurabh is doing, whatever we give a work to Saurabh, he's doing absolutely on the topmost sincerity. And uh, he's extremely reliable and very confident whatever he speaks. So uh, this is Saurabh. So Saurabh and Rabia, please go ahead. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Rabia, you can start. Yes, ma'am. A very good morning to one and all. Today, I will be presenting palliative dermatology, an area yet to be explored. I myself is Dr. Rabia Durasak, Senior Resident, MD Palliative Medicine, Ames, New Delhi. And thank you, Dr. Saurabh, Sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Onco Anesthesia and Palliative Medicine, NCI Jaja, Ames, New Delhi, for moderating my presentation. Now, skin disease with its accompanying discomfort and alteration in physical experience can be debilating to a person. For all those patients in a terminal stage of malignancy, the skin disease represents under consideration for symptom control to optimize their quality of life. When considering patients with malignancy, those in a hospital setting would be susceptible to cutaneous complication due to their underlying illness and its treatment, accompanied by immunosuppression state and decreased mobility. Now, palliative dermatology is a very new area. It is an area of care yet to be explored. So this study by N.A. Bishrul Hafi says that dermatologists are very rarely involved in palliative care, but the recent literature demands their active involvement because palliative care is aimed in reducing the physical, mental, social, and spiritual pain of all critically ill patients irrespective of the diagnosis. So there is a need for active involvement of palliative dermatology in dermatological OPDs. Now, why there is a need of integrating uh, palliative care in dermatology? Patients with conditions like psoriasis, eczema, and skin cancer frequently face psychological changes which in turn impact their social functioning. They may have fearful anticipation of interaction, symptoms even if the symptoms are not present, and develop avoidance coping mechanism. This may prevent them from social and recreational activities or employment. Now, psychodermatological uh, uh, involvement of palliative care patients, it is, there is an unconscionable bond between the skin and the brain. Both are ectodermal origin. Whenever there is a neurogenic inflammation where a stress-induced products of cutaneous sensory nerve endings trigger and induce a cutaneous inflammatory response, further illustrates the interconnection between the skin and the neural system. In hospice setting, it is noted that 50% of the patients will experience symptoms of depression, 70% may experience anxiety and nearly all patients will experience delirium as they near death. 
Now, dermatosis like uh, psoriasis with an established relationship with psychological factors can appear de novo or the pre-existing disease can be aggravated. Now, this is a recent study. Pratyush et al. in 2019 said that about 49.5% had clinically significant impairment of their dermatological quality of life. Clinically significant depression and anxiety was found in almost 45% of patients respectively. Therefore, screening of all the dermatological OPD patients for anxiety, depression and quality of life is at utmost importance. Now, palliative care in uh, dermatology, they can be broadly classified into dermatosis developing in palliative care patients and dermatosis requiring palliative care. Now, dermatosis in palliative care. Now, what is this? Palliative literature about skin is largely limited to wound care and management of pruritus. Barnaby et al., the most common condition encountered is dermatitis, which included seborrheic dermatitis, status dermatitis, and contact dermatitis. It was followed by cutaneous infections like bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. It was also striae and telangiectasia were also present in 16.9% of patients. Decapitus ulcer and xerosis were reported in 10.8% and 6.2% patients respectively. Now, what are the risk factors for developing dermatosis in palliative care patients? So, the prevalence of dermatosis is very high because most of these patients are either anorexic or cachexic. They're very much malnourished. They can have anemia. They can have metabolic alterations, immunosuppression because of the prolonged use of steroids, immobilization, difficult to move for proper skin care, and neurological disorders. Now, dermatosis requiring palliative care, according to the WHO, the patients who are suffering from the following inflammatory rheumatic diseases should be considered for palliative care management like vasculitis, connective tissue diseases, dermatomyositis, and special cause of disease like the malignant cause of rheumatoid arthritis, the development of a progressive pulmonary fibrosis in the context of an autoimmune disease. Now let's look into the chronic skin diseases. The first is psoriasis. Psoriasis is a chronic skin condition that is often associated with systemic manifestation like arthritis. It is estimated that around 2% of the U.S. adults are affected and the prevalence is about equal in men and women. Psoriasis can develop at any age, but the onset is mostly between 15 to 30 years of age. And the clinical cause is highly unpredictable. So an individualized and careful monitored therapy can minimize both the morbidity as well as enhance the quality of life. So you can see the schematic diagram showing that in psoriasis, the keratinocytes, the NKT cells, the macrophages, and the plasma uh, cytoids disease will actually cause an increased release of the inflammatory markers, that is the interleukin-1, interferon alpha-beta, tumor necrosing factor. Now, all these inflammatory markers are responsible for making an inflammatory cascade. There's increase in keratinocyte proliferation. There can be skin thickening and erythema, and there can be vasodilatation and angiogenesis. So all these inflammatory markers will cause a scaly lesion all around the skin. It can be behind the ear, scaling plague in psoriasis affecting the neck. It can be in the lower back, or it can be an erythematous plague in an inverse pattern as well in the axilla. The classic locations can be at the nape of the neck. You can see a scaly white lesion, or it can be at the elbows. So whenever the classic uh, importance of psoriasis is whenever we peel off these scales, there is minute drop, drops of bleeding that is called as auspice sign. This is very classic of psoriasis. There are various treatments available like topical therapies. You have the class 1 bitamethasone dipropate, class 2 amsinonide ointments, class 3 amsinonide cream or lotions, class 4 uh, steroids, class 5 steroids. So all this, I'm not going into the detail, but this is a summary of all the topical corticosteroids available in psoriasis. You can use the vitamin D analogs like the calcitrol combination of calcipotrin and calcipotriol, topical calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus, Keratolytic agents like tazoretine and salicylic acid. This has been uh, classically, you can go through the whole table, which will give in details of how to use, how much dose to use and when to use and what are the contraindication and the side effects. Now let's look into the second condition that is the vitiligo. The prevalence of vitiligo in a worldwide population is around 0.5 to 2 percentage. The disease is characterized by selective loss of melanocytes, which give you a pigment of the skin. It results in typical non-scaly, chalky white macules. Now, vitiligo is also an autoimmune disease. 
dismissed as a cosmetic problem, although it affects both the psychological and the physical devastingly, often with considerable burden in the daily life. Now, there can be two types. It can be segmental vitiligo, which has been localized to one particular area, or it can be non-segmental vitiligo, which is diffuse and generalized to the full body. Now, non-segmental vitiligo develops at all ages, but usually occurs in young people between the ages of 10 and 30 years. 25% of the vitiligo patients develop the disease before the age of 10 years, and uh, half of the patient will develop before the age of 20 years, and nearly 80% will develop it before the age of 30 years. Now, this is a study by Marwa Abent Elal Nasser et al. The prevalence of stress, 76%, anxiety, 78%, and depression is 80%. And the gender had a significant relationship with stress, anxiety, and depression in vitiligo patients. Female were considered to be more affected than male. Vitiligo is a psychocutaneous disease that does not only affect the patient's physical appearance, but also his mental and psychological status. So this study highlights how a chronic skin disease can actually affect your social well-being, your physical well-being, and your psychological well-being. Now, this is another study by Andrich et al. 2020. The general prevalence of anxiety among vitiligo patients was 35.8%. And the necessity of anxiety awareness in the management of patients with skin disease is of utmost importance. So you can see it can be a segmental vitiligo, generalized vitiligo, which is bilateral, often symmetrical, mended to macules or patches. Or it can be universalist, means the whole body is uh, having a loss of melanocytes leading to vitiligo. Or it can be an acrofacial vitiligo, deep migmented macules limited to periorifacial areas, distal extremities, or the face. So broadly, you can classify the vitiligo into two, that is non-segmental vitiligo and segmental vitiligo. In non-segmental vitiligo, offer camouflage and psycho psychological support, avoidance of corbinous phenomenon. If it is a very stable disease, you can go for non-surgical treatments like topical steroids can be used, targeted ultraviolet uh, B radi uh, radio uh, phototherapies can be used. If there is no response, stable disease more than one year and no corbinous phenomenon, you can always go for surgical treatment. And the surgical treatment available is you can go for skin grafting, you can go for hair transplantation or hair follicle transplantation, you can go for transplantation of the melanocytes into the particular vitiligo uh, areas, or it's a rapidly disease progression, you can go for systemic oral, uh, oral like uh, methotrexate, mini pulse, uh, steroids can be used. Now, if it is a segmental vitiligo, offer camouflage and psychological support again. Early phases and stable disease. Early phase, again, you can go for the topical uh, steroids or targeted UVB phototherapy. Or if it is a stable leukotrichia, you can always go for surgical treatment. So surgical treatment is always better if the disease is a stable condition. Now, few of the dermatoses like skin condition, which is uh, acquired during the palliative care treatment, it can be mostly seborrheic dermatitis, stasis dermatitis, contact dermatitis. So this is day-to-day -day practice. We may come across a lot of dermatitis cases. So it can be either because of the allergy. It can be atopic, that is the eczema, infection related. It can be irritant contact dermatitis, like the steriliums, which is causing neurodermatitis, perioral dermatitis, or seborrheic dermatitis. The most common which we encounter in our palliative care setting is seborrheic dermatitis. Now, what is seborrheic dermatitis? Now, it is a common chronic inflammatory skin disorder that mostly affects the young adults in areas rich in sebaceous glands. So these areas like the scalp, the face, and the trunk is a most common size of seborrheic dermatitis. In adolescents and adults, uh, seborrheic dermatitis clinical presentation may vary. Some of the patients might have some mild patches. Some may have diffuse scalp scaling. In infants, it is classically seen as a cradle cap, that is a scaly yellowish patches over the scalp. In adults, several environmental factors will uh, trigger the uh, formation of seborrheic dermatitis. And one of the most common uh, organisms involved is the fungal melazasia. The sebaceous gland activity, if there is an immunosuppression state, endocrine, neurogenic or iatrogenic factors, all leading to seborrheic dermatitis. The diagnosis is usually clinical and specific laboratory and instrumental investigation are seldom required. So you can send for fungal cultures, you can uh, for, go for fungal uh, evaluations of melazasia for confirmation uh, clinically uh, or uh, laboratorily. 
Now, what is the treatment you can provide for these patients who are presenting with seborrheic dermatitis? The treatment is aimed at three things. First of all, modulating the sebum production. Second, reduce the skin colonization by malassezia and controlling inflammation like the topical antifungals. You have a lot of available creams like ketoconazole, uh, cyclopyrox, uh, you have the meconazole or anti-inflammatory if mild to moderate potency steroids or keratolytic agents or humectant like propylene glycol agents. The recommended is topical therapeutic option for mild to moderate uh, areas is topical ketoconazole, mild to moderate potency corticosteroids like lithium succinate or gluconate and topical calcineurin inhibitors. In severe or resistant cases, the use of systemic antifungals like ter uh, terbinafine, itraconazole, or ultraviolet B phototherapy may be considered. So this is an overview of the management of seborrheic dermatitis, Federica dal Alucco, if anyone wants to go in detail about the diagnosis and the management. Now coming to the next is status dermatitis, also called as venous eczema status eczema or venous uh, seborrheic dermatitis or gravitational dermatitis. It is a chronic inflammatory skin disease driven by underlying chronic venous insufficiency that typically affects the lower extremities of older individuals. In seborrheic dermatitis, there can be alteration in the function of deep venous pulses at the lower extremity causes a blood to backflow to the superficial venous system leading to venous hypertension, cutaneous inflammation and complications including venous ulcers. Now, this is a new study uh, which was published, uh, Gill Hospice in 2022. Cornerstone treatment are, now how, how do you manage status dermatitis? So, you can give compression therapy to ameliorate the pain and swelling. Second, you can use the topical treatments to elevate the secondary sin infection like topical mipromycin can be used, topical ketoconazoles can be used and interventional treatment to correct the venous reflex. So, this is more like a stasis leading to venous uh, stasis and leading to um, ulcerations. So as I explained, non-pharmacological, you can encourage the patient to do exercise, walking, leg elevations, stockings or bandages, or topical dressings can be used. non soap cleansers like barrier preparation, blood emollients, and you can use good moisturizers available. Topical high or mid-potency corticosteroid creams can be used. Topical calcineurin inhibitors, antihistaminics and pulse flight uh, treatment like the UVB phototherapies. Now coming to the that was about uh, first of all dermatitis has been explained status dermatitis. Now looking into the xerosis. Now this is a very common condition. Dry skin. Now dry skin is a very common condition even in the general population and can be a symptom of certain dermatoses. Necessarily it is an indication of diseased skin since its condition can be due to predisposing environmental factors or other circumstances like excessive washing of your hands. Severe xerosis can lead to the onset of a type of eczema characterized by intensively itchy, fissured and cracked skin called xerotic eczema or eczema crackling. Now, dry skin again affects the patient's quality of life and severe xerosis can interfere with work productivity especially when the hands are affected. So how do you do a proper skin care and hydration? That this is not only for xerosis, you can, use, you can apply this treatment charts for all the skin diseases. So drink sufficient water, eat a varied and balanced diet, including plenty of fruits and vegetables, avoid smoking and alcohol consumption and direct exposure to sunlight, take regular moderate exercises, for daily hygiene, use soaps that have an acidic pH and contain humectants. Now, what are the specific recommendations for the management of dry skin? Now, after bathing in lukewarm water, immediately apply a preparation that prevents the evaporation of water from the surface of the skin. Now, avoid using any friction caused by rubbing with sponges or bath gloves. Use spokes specifically designed not to irritate the skin. Do not use any lotions, clogs, uh, perfumes or similar products that contain alcohol. Wear very soft fabrics, preferably cotton, in contact with the skin and avoid dyed clothing. So there are a lot of agents available like the humectants like hydrocarbons, fatty oils and alcohols, colloid substances and silicones. Hydrating agents like uh, polyols, urea, reconstituted natural moisturizing factor or hyaluronic acid can also be used. Now re-lipidating active ingredients like ceramides, cholesterol, essential fatty acids, other active ingredients like oats, allantoin, alpha bisidolol, aloe vera and uh, Glycetheretic acid can be used for uh, skin hydration as well as maintaining the integrity of the skin. 
Now, going into an important topic that is a decubitus ulcer, which is very common in all the palliative care centers, because we have patients who are PS4, who are bedridden, and who are in the bed for more than 50% of their uh, daily time. So decubitus ulcers, also known as bed sores or pressure sores, are caused by impaired blood supply and tissue malnutrition owing to prolonged pressure over skin, soft tissue, muscle, and bone. Now, whenever there's a prolonged pressure, there's an inadequate blood flow, toxic metabolites will accumulate, and this leads to ulceration and necrosis of the skin and underlying tissue. This process can be accelerated if the lymphatic ducts are also blocked and if reperfusion injury occurs after load removal. Now, constant pressure can come from lying down. Decubitus itself means by Latin decumbre, that is to lie down, or from sitting. The skin overlying the sacrum and the hips are the most often affected, 67%. Decubitus ulcers can develop any part of the body where sustained pressure and compressing forces are maintained for a sufficient period of time. So now looking into the stages of uh, decubitus ulcers, there are four stages. First of all, the stage one, where the skin is broken, unbroken but inflamed. So you can see just an erythema. Stage two, the skin is broken and the epi to the epidermis or the dermis. Three, an ulcer extends to the subcutaneous fat layer. And in four, an, uh, the ulcer extends even more to the muscle and the bones. So you can see the in this picture, I wanted to show the most important areas. So you can see the occiput, the knee, the heels, the knees, and then uh, the sacral region are the most common places where there is a lot of uh, force where and the blood supply is compromised. Now, what are the do's and don'ts? So then let's look into the don'ts. What should we shouldn't be doing? Do not use donor type cushions and devices and keep the skin dry. What are the do's? Move the patient and encourage the patient to move every two hourly. Keep the skin very clean and lubricated. Use pressure relief devices such as pillows, foam cushions, air mattresses, or bed, uh, water mattresses, gel heel protectors can be used. Pay special attention to the skin areas with little fat padding such as the bony prominences. Put patient on a stool and urine voiding schedule. Use incontinence devices as an appropriate. Keep inclined no higher than 30 degrees to prevent sliding and friction on lower back and buttocks. So if we have a Braden scale in order to a risk assessment to be completed on admission each 24 hours for patients with decreased level of mobility in relation to developmental age. So this can be used in our settings. The intensity and duration of pressure. Look at the mobility of the patient first. The activity, the physical activity and the sensory perception. And you can grade them according to completely immobile, very limited, slightly limited or no limitation. Now looking at the tolerance of the skin and the supporting structure. Now, what is the moisture of the skin? Is there any friction or shear? What is the nutritional status of the patient? The tissue perfusion and the oxygenation. So accordingly, you can uh, term a patient at high risk, mild risk, 16 to 23 score. A moderate is 13 to 14. A high risk, 10 to 12. And very high risk, 9 or below. Now, you can see when the, the stage 1, there is just erythema. Stage 2, Stage three, it is uh, and entering into the subcutaneous tissue, and stage four, it is the bone, the muscles, everything is being involved. Now, this is a table which is uh, summarizing the whole structured risk assessment. All patients with alteration in skin intact, such as dry skin, excessive moisture or redness, patient with signs of altered nutrition perfusion problems, older age, decreased uh, increased friction and shear or altered mobility, decreased sensory perception. As I said, the skincare has to be done. Regularly assess each patient's skin for redness, dryness, blanching, localized heat, edema, hardness, areas of discomfort or pain, and medical devices which are pressing on the skin. And the nutrition for pressure ulcer prevention use a team approach for nutrition risk assessment and intervention. If indicated for patients with nutritional risk, offer high protein supplements between meal times in addition to the usual diet. So once the decubitus ulcer develops, there are various uh, dressing materials available. Now looking into the next is hyperpigmentation due to radiation therapy. So radiation therapy can lead to melasma, it can lead to freckles and sun damage, or it can lead to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. 
Now, this is a recent study. The radiation irritated hyperpigmentation may impact the quality of life of breast cancer patient after whole breast radiotherapy. In this study, they show that the breast cancer patient after whole breast radiotherapy may experience skin dryness, hypersensitivity, hyperpigmentation on the irradiated skin area. Now, these radiation irradiated skin lesion may induce depressive psychological status and impact the quality of life in breast cancer patient after whole breast radiotherapy. Now, this is a study uh, by Nicola Alessandro in 2020 says that the topical treatment for radiation-induced dermatitis. Now, radiation-induced dermatitis is a very common uh, uh, symptom which we come across in our daily OPDs. So, what can we do? The basic recommendation is wear loose clothing. Second is don't use the normal razors, use electric razors. And avoid sun exposure, cosmetic products, so extreme temperature is always advisable. And if it is grade 3 and 4, you can always use the topical mipromycin antibiotic creams can be used. You can use these saline soap dressings, which will give a soothing effect. And you have to, main, most important is you have to counsel the patient. Now, this is a self-resolving dermatitis and it takes time, but it will resolve in the due course of time. But if the patient is in a 3 or grade 4 dermatitis, then only you have to go for saline dressings, cold compressions, topical antibiotics, topical antifungals. So our main aim should be avoid super added infections or uh, superficial cutaneous infections. So I would like to conclude that 50% of the patients will experience symptoms of depression, 70% will experience clinically significant anxiety, and nearly all patients will experience delirium as they near the death. The management of psychological symptoms, functional impairment, and quality of life across the illness trajectory should be the main aim in integrating palliative care physicians during the course of illness. The evaluation of the social symptoms of serious illness, particularly caregiver burden. Caregiver burden has a well documented in the range of serious illnesses, but has not been systemically explored in severe dermatological disease. So what is the take-home message here? Psychodermatological issues are highly common in patients with chronic disease. A detailed evaluation and early referral to the palliative care is of utmost importance. All patients should be screened for depression, anxiety, and stress presenting to the dermatology OPD. You can use the DAS score, that is Depression Anxiety Stress Score. Palliative dermatology is an area yet to be explored, and more research and studies are needed in this field. Thank you. Wow. Very good, uh, Kavya. Thank you. Uh, Saram, you want to yes, say something? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, Rabia, she's presented very well and she's put it in a very concise way. Uh, this was a new topic for every one of us. And uh, what I would like to say is there is two areas, which is... Uh, palliative care in a dermatology setting with a chronic diseases like albinism and psoriasis, which lead to an altered physical form of the patient and may lead to stress and anxiety, which is a very new area and is yet to be explored. But literature is coming up with recommendations and suggestions that palliative care and uh, evaluation of stress anxiety needs to be integrated in this field as early as possible. So there is a role of palliative care in dermatology also, which will be explored in the coming years. And we need to be aware of that. And we may get patients with stress and anxiety with chronic skin conditions. The other thing is a cancer patient with a dermatological condition, which we as palliative care uh, physicians need to identify and give a reference to the dermatologist or treat with home-based remedies or in a home care setting. So basic skin conditions like atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, xerosis, and uh, decubitus ulcers. Everybody should be aware of their presentation and their diagnosis and the risk factors for them and the basics of treatment. So this was the gist of today's lecture. And senior present in the group, if they have any insights, they may please uh, enlighten us. Saurav, there are one or two questions. Can you take up first? Yes, ma'am. I'll just see. One question only, the rest are the compliments. But one question you take up and then we can ask serious. Uh, somebody has asked, autoimmune skin disorders and cancer conceptually, aren't they mutually antagonizing? 
uh, I'll have to look more into this, but uh, autoimmune skin disorders like uh, vitiligo and all, uh, vitiligo, they are uh, mentioned in some places in literature as precancerous lesion, which may lead to uh, diseases such as skin cancers, but I have not found anything which may say that they are mutually antagonizing because cancer cells have their own mechanisms which they surpass the, uh, they bypass the normal uh, apoptosis and death cycle of the cells. So autoimmune skin condition will you, theoretically affect the normal cells of the body and but, uh, cancer cells will not be affected by that. That is what I understand, but I'll look again in the literature for this. So, uh, thank you, Saurabh. Before we ask from uh, seniors, I just want to ask Rabia. Rabia, uh, before uh, by preparing this lecture, what was there in your mind and what extra, uh, what do you think that uh, how this knowledge which you have gathered, because the, I know that the residents, those who are preparing lectures, they are reading a lot is going to help you in future. So what was there in your mind? Have you read this topic before while doing, while giving your exam, MD exam, or this was first time extensive reading and then how it will be beneficial for you in your future. And after that, we I request, uh, I can see Nandani here. So Nandani, if you have any comment and any senior person, those who wants to speak, so first, Rabia, please, can you narrate your experience? Uh, thank you for your question, ma'am. Actually, ma'am, uh, during my exam preparation time, there was one chapter in Oxford which says skin diseases in palliative care. And that was usually covering only the wound management and the pruritus were the patient present, but it did not show any uh, specific uh, chronic skin disease like psoriasis, vitiligo, eczema, dermatitis. It did not cover this, ma'am. So for me, palliative dermatology topic was very new and uh, I was also surprised to get a topic like this. So when I started reading about it, I understood that yes definitely in patients who are psoriasitic or vitiligo these diagnoses actually impacts their social life their well-being and they have been stressed out and this disease does, is not curative it it has it is a very chronic disease and it, there are a lot of relapses and they have been into a psychological uh, issues depression stress anxiety and myself i have come across my auntie who has been uh, suffering from psoriasis since the age of 30 years and multiple episodes of severe psoriatic diseases. She needed inpatient admission. She was very depressed with her life. So I think this palliative dermatology is a very good topic and I definitely want to look into it and in integrate palliative medicine in derm uh, dermatology. And few of the SRs also had a talk with Ames New Delhi. So they are also saying that there is a need for you people to come around, talk to them, counsel them, be a part of their treatment because it will definitely help in the course of time because once mm -hmm. it's not only treating their disease, but also you have to be a part of their overall well-being that is the spiritual part the, the psychological part the social part ma'am so this was a very new topic and i definitely think that it is a at most importance and all the palliative care physician has to look forward to be a part of their dermatological disease uh, treatment and course of time very good Rabbi. thank you so nandani would you like to comment on this lecture or anything you want to add Thank you, Sushma, and thank you, Rabia. Um, this was, uh, you know, uh, very uh, concisely presented. Uh, <clears throat> what I would like to add is the commonest references that we get from dermatology department is uh, during these during these uh, pen figures and many other, um, you know, skin lesions. Patient goes through a phase of acute pain also, either due to the oral lesions or due to the skin lesions. And very often uh, we are, uh, you know, involved uh, right from that stage to handle the excruciating pain. So, and, you know, anti-inflammatory mix for the oral care because they are not able to feed, etc. So those uh, are uh, some of the commonest references that we get. And secondly, uh, the, um, you know, post-herpetic neuralgias, um, right from the stage of uh, diagnosis onwards, they involve the palliative care team so that uh, we could... Uh, you know, pick up and treat the neuralgias early and consistently. So besides these two, uh, if I, I want to uh, understand also like, you know, what um, 
depending on the capacity of the team. Suppose we start accepting um, patients with any chronic disease, uh, although the definition of palliative care is that those who are you know, diagnosed with the chronic and uh, life-limiting conditions, I don't know whether we would be enough. The number of people who are there in the hospital in palliative care, would we be enough to handle all those uh, when it comes to uh, holistic management and you know, psychosocial support of every patient who has a chronic condition will have uh, you know, psychosocial and other uh, repercussions. I'm not sure. Uh, at this I stage. can answer this, Nandini. I can answer yes, this. So, uh, so, Nandini, this is what uh, uh, what was the... This is an important uh, question and important concern. Uh, this is what we have felt when we have started uh, integration of palliative care in cardiology, neurology, pulmonology, everywhere. So, uh, uh, in emergency medicine, and as the time progresses, uh, our burden in increases. But definitely, if we are starting the courses, uh, DNB or MD courses, over a period of three years, we will have enough residents. So, with the help of residents, we can cover most of the areas. This is what we are we are doing. That our residents are looking after most of the patients and. The faculty, those who are taking rounds on the next day, uh, they are, in, in case if there is any specific issue, which residents think that it should be seen by a senior person, they ask us to go and uh, see there. But definitely, it, we need a huge team. We need a huge team. and huge, But we cannot wait for a huge team to become because we have to start as soon as possible uh, in various areas. And it is not that people will start sending a lot of consultation. Uh, maybe we are getting three or four consultation from neuro in a month one or two consultation from cardiology in a month pulmonology maybe five to ten consult consultation emergency medicine maybe 10 to 20 consultations so it will it will happen over a period of time so uh, we have to keep our uh, uh, this is my opinion that we have to keep our arms open to try to uh, handle as many things as possible but definitely, it is going to be a slow process. Yeah. So, uh, from their side also, and from our side, definitely, it is going to be a problem. So yeah. we Thanks, have to uh, organize our manpower. Maybe nurses can be trained. Nurses so, can be trained in this area. Yeah, yeah. That's that's so what I was coming to. That's what I was coming to. So I was wondering, you know, we need to do two few things to definitely these patients deserve that care but uh, whether we could have some kind of a screening and also some kind of generalist palliative care capacity development across uh, different specialities and of course at the undergraduate level. So what happens is the little more complex ones reach us. So we could have a you know, gradation. Suppose the, you know, the references are increasing. That's what you know, we have also started doing because all these are similar numbers, even in this institution, the kind of references we get from different specialities. But um, like eventually, uh, it should not become like a paleophilia that any, they will not touch anything other than the skin or the heart or whatever. So the whole idea is like integrating some academics, integrating some research, integrating some classes so that everyone has a fair idea of the basic stuff and uh, at least identifying a few things which require up, uh, upscaling into palliative care specialist uh, department. So that is what I was coming to. And nurses, as you said, Sushma, is an excellent resource for screening. So for example, in our uh, hospital, we have to, I don't know, even in your hospital, it must be happening, integrated palliative care across the world. So the nurses would screen and if there is something more than this, like, you know, the score is more than this or something, then we get into the picture, not otherwise. Otherwise, the normal handling of different SRS uh, listed symptoms, uh, if they are mild, if they are low, even in, in uh, nephro care, etc. If it is serious and overwhelming, uh, then it is uh, taken over. I mean, uh, co-managed co by us. Uh, so that is the idea that I was trying to talk about. Definitely, it's not that these patients should not be receiving the care, but somehow we need to create a system so that every more and more people get the care and not only where palliative care uh, large team exists. Thanks. So uh, this is true. 
that uh, we have to give evidence based care then only people will listen and then only people will integrate and this is what has happened in recent conference last conference where Naveen has created a lot of verticals and we have given a lot of evidence and people were involved so it was a good strategy nurses should definitely be the part of the uh, any of uh, the system so that they can screen the patient but now sort of there are so many uh, questions you have already answered i think huh so um, i mostly you... answered thoda bed so dressing up we'll try to include the some yeah, yeah, slides yeah that is a separate and... topic i think it is we can't we can't take it up, let's take up right now so i just want to have a nurses comments if any nurse wants to give any comments the, I can see a lot of good nurses, those who are working and practicing. Uh, anyone? Maybe Kusum, you want to say something? Kusum is a faculty of uh, nursing college from Ames, one of the Ames. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Morning, yes, good morning. Ma'am, uh, as as we are discussing, like like uh, in the in the in the skin or dermatology. Nurses play a vital role, and I uh, INC also they incorporated the palliative care co uh, subject or kind of few component in the in the nursing curriculum. So our future nurses uh, they will be equipped with the palliative care knowledge in the in in coming coming future. So lot of initiative are taken care to educate our budding nurses now. So, anyone wants to ask anything, any resident? If there is no, there are no questions, then I just want to say that if you have seen any skin disorder patient, skin is the most uh, favorite body organ of ours. If something happens in the skin, I think we are the people, those who get extremely depressed. If it happens in the on the face, I think it is become it becomes a big problem face or any exposed area. And if we are not going to be normal, and we are going to be depressed, and we are going to be anxious, that it should get this, uh, it should be corrected as soon as possible. And this also I have seen that dermata derma problems they take years together. They are not they are not going to be all right within one day or two days. So. It is going to be a area which we need to explore that how we can incorporate. And there are certain, certain situations where people are, uh, because of the terminal event or terminal diseases in Derma, uh, they are dying, and but they are still in very, very distress and the family members are in distress. So there are a lot of unexplored, unexplored area in, the, in this area. And I hope, uh, I, I think we are, I'm just missing one thing that we could have, uh, ask Sarah, one of our Dharma faculty to be there in this class. But next time we will make sure that in such classes, our Dharma faculty, any of the Dharma faculty can be the part of the classes so that uh, they can also listen that how palliative care physicians are discussing these problems aggressively. So uh, thank you very much, Saurav and Rabia. And thank you everyone for uh, uh, joining okay. and thank you. Uh, Nandini, for your important comments, uh, Saurabh, if you want to say last thank minute you, anything, otherwise we can we can just close this. No, ma'am. We uh, in maybe in the next schedule we can put up a bed sore management as a detailed topic and then add on to this topic also. Otherwise, nothing from this. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. See you next Monday before six thirty. Thanks a lot.